Formula One motor racing is glamorous, fast, dangerous, and certainly the most expensive sport in the world. Formula One is power, is a fight between driver, is speed, is excitement, is everything together that is not only sport, it's the big event. The drivers are all young and fearless, and with the pit crews, spend most of the year travelling to exotic locations around the world. Formula One without victory, it's always a... Uh... Uh, missing uh, everything. Each of the top teams spends in excess of £40 million every season in the quest to be the best. In the 1997 season, one of the most fashionable teams in the pit lane, the Benetton team, opened their doors to television cameras as they launched their assault on the World Championship. On and off the track, it was to be one of the most eventful seasons in their history. Impossible. The Benetton family joined Formula One as a sponsor to various teams in the early 1980s. Their interest developed to such an extent that in 1986 they bought out the British Tolman team. In 1989, the family placed an Italian in charge, a former ski instructor, a state agent and clothing salesman, Flavio Briatore. Incredibly, he'd never been to a Grand Prix before 1987, but immediately impressed his flamboyant image on the team. Benetton developed with limited success before discovering a young German driver, Michael Schumacher. Within three years, he had driven them to the first World Championship. The following year, in 1995, they won it again. But in 1996, the wheels came off. Schumacher left for Ferrari and was replaced by Gerhard Berger and Jean Alessi. After the success of back-to-back -back championship winning seasons, the Benetton team didn't win a race all year. Last year this time, I would say, oh, it's going to be a great season because the experience from the Benetton team was that the car never stops. So I said, even, even if the performance is not f super quick, you're still going to be look good and it ends up completely different. I stopped a lot of time and uh, everything went in a different way. We made a massive error on the design of the 1996 car, it was a dog, and it was quite a job to steer the development of the 97 car in the right areas and we've basically got a good car, but it's, it's still lacking in certain areas. We'd become the long shot. Um, that's never been our approach. We had a bad year last year. It just makes us try harder. London in February. In a celebrity-owned restaurant, the Benetton team unveiled the 1997 car to the world's media. From their new position of long shots, the unveiling is a crucial curtain raiser. As the final preparations are rushed through, here the pressure is similarly rising on a disused airstrip in Northamptonshire, where Gerhard Berger puts the new car through its paces for the final time before the opening race of the season. Not without problems. They're gonna break. What's happened is I need to slow down on the brake. You know, I, I come, I brake, I position the feet right on the brake like this. Then I need to open the clutch, but I cannot. Back in London, even managing director Briatori is called upon to help out at the door as the media clamour to get in. These are tense moments for the team. Okay, it's like it's the most important thing. But we haven't got Korean Air or Akai. Oh, that's the most important. Jackie, we haven't got Korean Air. Akai is being brought by Rodel or Olivier, I guess. Okay. And they're both to go on the reception desk to be given out with the press pass. No. Guys, move back, please. Move back, please. With Briatori now in a more familiar role, the proceedings get underway. About everything today, who always looks very healthy. 
Flavio Briatori, the man with the wonderful tan. Can you tell? <laughs> can you tell us, Flavio? Where have you hidden it? Let's see the car, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The top secret design is now on show for the world to see. All Benetton's hopes lie in the B197. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the final pre-season test at Santa Pod, the team think they've found the solution to Gerhard Berger's pedal problem. It's his shoes. They knew it. Huh? They quite knew the boots. No, no, it's a real problem. I go in and show you. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. So you have to move your, your left foot. I don't know. It's worse than normal. So it's maybe about the long build. Yeah. It's hitting hard on here, so you can't move. Because you've got like hangover on you your boot. The sole of your boot. No. I think what we need to do is a little bit back on the on the throttle pedal and a little bit on the clutch. You know. The pressure is is very high this time of year because you have the expectation of, of people over the whole winter. Yeah, that's all fine now. Yeah, it's all, it's all okay. Okay, Rod. With Berger happier, the team restart the car and continue refining the pit stops that could save them crucial seconds at the first race in Australia. The circuit times they've already recorded in the pre-season have put them among the fastest cars for the coming season. At odds of 8-1, to one, Berger is one of the favourites for the championship. Melbourne and the first Grand Prix of the season. An excitable Jean Alessi tries to get into the circuit for the practice session. <laughs> Gate one. The vehicle access pass? Yeah, but I'm a Formula One driver. I'm Jean Lazy. Uh, as soon as you get one, can you ensure that you put it on your That's vehicle? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. The media come back to the next one. Here. No, I'm not media, you know. You have to pick something up from He's no. Lazy. I'm a Formula One driver, yeah. I'm Alizy. Yeah. I'm just back. I yeah. go down of the car oh, and I go to the no Thank problem. you. Thank you very much. In the circuit for the first race, Alessi and the Benetton team are, based on last season's results, pitched in a garage next to the Ferrari team and old boy Michael Schumacher. To compound the problems, Schumacher has been joined during the close season by Benetton's technical director, Ross Braun, and the chief designer, Rory Byrne. It was the combination of these three that proved so successful in winning Benetton's double world championship. The man who's left to pick up the pieces is Benetton's chief designer, Nick Worth. The former boss of the now defunct Simtech team, and still only 31, is seen as one of the rising stars of Formula One. The reuniting of the Schumacher triumvirate and the worry that Braun and Byrne may have left with vital information on this year's Benetton car are just part of the intrigue for Worth. Ross and Rory have absolutely no idea of what we're doing because I didn't tell them any of the ideas that, that we had for development during the time that I knew that they would be on their way. In fact, I went so far as to, to tell Rory a whole load of things that I wasn't going to do. Um, so hopefully he's doing them at Ferrari. Um, in fact, I know he's doing one of them, so that's good. Um, but yeah, you, 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 never, you don't trust anyone. And I didn't, I didn't trust the fact that he said he was retiring. And I was right, so that was good. In the same restaurant as his former technical director, Jean Alessi discusses the repercussions of Braun's departure. Nick said, to fight for a great job, and he's strong, and he's very intelligent. But he's young, so when you're young, you can do some errors. In a team, uh, if someone is leaving, that means he doesn't fit with the others. Probably uh, they... Uh, it was time for him to go, and now people are working much more easily in Benetton. Already at the circuit, the pit crew prepare the car for the day ahead. 
when Alessi and Berger arrive, they'll have an intense 12 laps to try and record the fastest lap. The quickest driver will play in the coveted pole position for tomorrow's race. For Gerhard Berger, the priority is keeping in shape for the first race. At 37, he's the oldest Formula One driver, and in what may be his last season, fitness will play a crucial role. The racing, I think, is a special kind of sport where people see just the car and the driving, what seems to be not physically difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's like everything where you compete with the best ones on the world, you have to put a lot of effort in. Doesn't matter if you are working, sport, whatever it is, you know, when you when you are try to get the best of the world, fighting with the 10 best, 20 best of the world, the air is very thin. With the hour of qualifying approaching, the team are about to find out if pre-season testing has paid off. To go home and be happy is a position under the first three to be on the podium. Right. And I think it's a realistic goal, but uh, on the other side we have to say it's the first race. We don't know our competitors, how strong they are really, who is strong in reliability, who is strong on performance, who is, who is good. Position here. But it's not just the competition to worry about. There are still problems with his car's pedals. Which pedals is this? It's a pad we had, but it's uh, the IBS pedal step. This car is fine. Yeah, this one is just like normal. See this? Is it to move forward the pedal? Can it move forward? Huh? You want it to move forward? Yeah. But it's the same position. It's exactly the same. as you keep running there was a sequence of failures we had a sensor failure we had an engineer failure we had a driver failure we had a lot of all the indicators that point to this problem all went wrong at the same time and I've never ever known anything like it in my entire Formula One career neither has Pat neither have the drivers it was just extraordinary but it happened and we should have picked it up tell me when these wheels go on yeah yeah do you want to do you want to get the type 4 ready you are f***ing joking no no I when the car eventually does get out of the garage, things go from bad to worse. At the end of qualifying, the Benetton cars are languishing in 10th and 8th on the starting grid. A massive three seconds a lap off the man in pole position, Jacques Villeneuve. Cracks are beginning to show after the bullish pre-season talk. We, we, we really did show the world how badly you could do and you know I as a as a someone very much involved in it I take my full share of the of the blame. Managing director Flavio Briatori returns from the track with his personal assistant. After such a good pre-season performance he's finding it difficult to comprehend why the team's efforts cannot be sustained in qualifying. As the pit crew drown their sorrows in the hotel bar, the technical directors are equally mystified. <laughs> I, said, I said to you that's what we did from Williams. Sorry? That's what we did here from Williams. Yeah. They're, not, they're not looking that good. They're, they're worried. They really are worried. I must say, I'm still nervous of a few things on the car. That one day we'll achieve our ideal of Formula One car. Well, <laughs> running the car that we we actually race. It takes time. It takes time and, uh, and uh, culture and education. And, uh, oh, we got damn sight closer this year. Then. Yeah. If we got it out early and it could all turn to shit yeah. and everything had gone wrong, then we'd have not been able to argue our case anymore. Exactly. Exactly. When press officer Spinelli joins them, the talk turns from the technical <laughs> to the personal, and the time that the pit crew should be in bed. Brazil, Argentina, everybody's in bed by now. Don't you think that it does affect a little bit? What? Thank you. Thank the you for the Patrizia needn't have worried, as the pit crew, like a well-drilled battalion, were up and primed long before anyone else. 
Now we have a good turnaround time. Because Chico always showers before he goes to bed. So he gets up and just does a quick scrape and clean his teeth and stuff for a while. Shower about 20 minutes. Which is not bad actually. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. It's 6 30 a.m. and the day's work has begun. They reached the track up to 10 hours before the race. Today they've had four hours sleep, have been worked until the early hours, searching for the cause of the poor qualifying performance. There's little more than camaraderie to keep them awake. Fox FM, We're selling badges for the Spastic Society, which is a really good cause here in um, Australia. And you can have whatever you want for breakfast. There's donuts and bananas and juice and anything you like. Have you got about five minutes? Oh, you have Sorry. Oh, right. You told us we would have left five minutes earlier oh, okay. this morning. All right, guys. Thanks. All right. What a lovely girl. <laughs> what a lovely darling. How many donuts left anyway? <laughs> for marketing director John Postlethwaite, a more leisurely breakfast means time to measure the qualification shortcomings in financial terms. Well, my main responsibility this weekend is explaining to the lots, lots of new sponsors that we've got why we're only 8th and 10th on the grid after Saturday qualifying. I spoke to Jean last night and, uh, and I reminded him that he does very good starts, but he said, yeah, but you have to be careful because this time I will not uh, risk too much. It's too, you know, too much mistake. I don't want to, to make a mistake at the beginning of the season. It's better to, to finish the race. No, don't worry about us, mate. We're just trying to get to work. That's all. It'd be great if we got a podium in the top three. But it's going to be difficult from eighth and tenth on the grid. I guess it depends uh, how we've managed to solve the problems in the warm-up. That's the limit of the good settings. Just don't get hard to just get hard to push like I figured it out about an hour and a half before the race, <laughs> which was a bit disappointing. We were in the middle of a meeting, um, which is quite a serious pre-race meeting. I was so unhappy with what was happening. And I've been staring at my computer all night, and the, since we've been there, really, it wasn't coming. And then I don't want to go into too much details about what went wrong, but I'm just so pleased that we picked it up before the race because it enabled us to scrabble some sort of result together. Because I can assure you, we wouldn't have been in the in the points if we hadn't have found it. Despite resolving some of the technical problems, the Benettons are still seemingly too far down the grid to trouble the three major rivals, Williams, Ferrari and McLaren. Alessi and Berger move themselves up immediately from the start, but at the first corner, Britain Johnny Herbert takes out race leader Villeneuve. Berger and Alessi then remarkably follow each other up to fourth and second. But with Alessi due for a refueling stop, serious problem surfaces. We have a failure in the radio, and the radio is what we use to communicate with, uh, with the driver. Unfortunately, Jean was so concentrated in, uh, in catching the guy in the front, the forgot to look <laughs> in the pit wall. I was not watching the board because I was just waiting the, the, the time to, to be called from them. Jean was not paying attention to what was happening in the race around him because he was fully aware of the strategy and therefore should have been aware when Gerhard disappeared from his gearbox that, that he'd come in for a stop and he knew that he was due for a stop very soon after. The pit crew waits but there's no sign of a lacy. The car was going quicker and quicker and quicker and you can feel this catching the guy in the front. And that drive, it basically it blind completely uh, any other thought. 
<laughs> they just keep passing and passing. And you can see his helmet, you know, as the driver goes by, you can see them do that. And I could see that Jean was just totally focused on the car in front of him. And, uh, and so I knew it was a... I knew we were going to be in for trouble, and we were, which is a shame. Yeah, after when really I, I stopped without fuel, because uh, what, when you imagine uh, something so so small in the Formula One, a radio not working, and you stop the Grand Prix because the radio was not working, it was very bad for me. You just cannot ever, ever do that again. You do something else, and then you fix that, but for God's sake, don't ever do that again. The McLaren team are left to celebrate a Lacey's misfortune as David Coulthard comes home the winner. Gerhard Berger finishes just off the podium, but gets into the points with fourth. Neither a Lacey nor Berger hang around for the celebrations though, as they leave together to catch their evening flight out of the country and mull over the first race of the season. How was your kind of in the race? Well, it was alright. Yeah? Too stiff. Sliding a bit too much, but uh, the balance was, was a bit better than yours, my car. Yeah? Yeah. In the second half, I was quite a bit better because I had no car in front of me, so the tires worked a bit better. You know, there's been a nightmare, so you tend to forget about Australia. The whole weekend was a bit uh, a d disaster. You know, there were, we lack of performance. We expect the car to be a lot quicker. I said to, to Flavio, um, and I said, you know, we, we're not in the position to beat Williams. We won't be in the position to beat Williams for a little while. There's no point just coming in. There's no magic. It's just hard work. Alessi is at the centre of press reports after the race that he's been fined his race fee. Benetton severely rebuked him, but he was paid his money, a total of a quarter of a million pounds. In the next year in the fast lane, we follow Benetton's entrepreneurial managing director, Flavio Briatori, as he prepares for the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola. But the team is still not firing on all cylinders. I never in 10 years, I never had a break like this one, here. You know what I mean? We're gonna, we've got to sort the brakes out.